Good afternoon. I hope everyone is having a good day. Sorry, we're a few minutes late. I got caught up talking with people and uh, lost track of time. Uh, but it's wonderful to see each of you here this evening. Uh, as we get started this evening, please join me in singing Higher Ground. Uh, it is song number 421 in your songbooks or on the walls behind me here. Higher Ground. Let's stand as we sing. Remain standing for a word of prayer this evening. I'm pressing on the upward way, new heights I'm gaining every day. So praying as I'm onward bound, Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's table land, a higher plane than I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. My heart has no desire to stay Where doubts arise and fears dismay Though some may dwell where these abound My prayer, my aim is higher ground Lord, lift me up and let me stand By faith on heaven's table land A higher plane than I have found Lord, plant my feet on higher ground I want to live above the world, though Satan's darts at me are hurled. For faith has caught the joyful sound, the song of saints on higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand, by faith on heaven's table land. A higher plane than I have found, but plant my feet on higher ground. I want to scale the utmost height and catch a gleam of glory bright. But still I'll pray till heaven I've found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand. My faith on heaven's table land, a higher plane than I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Amen. Brother Larry, would you leave us in prayer this evening? Amen. You may be seated as we sing, I am resolved no longer to linger, 455. I am resolved no longer to linger, charmed by the world's delight. Things that are higher, things that are nobler, these have allured my sight. Hasten to him, hasten so glad and free. Jesus, greatest, highest, I will come to thee. I am resolved to go to the Savior, leaving my sin and strife. He is a true one, he is a just one, he hath the words of life. Hasten to him, hasten so glad and free. Jesus, greatest, highest, I will come to thee. I am resolved to follow the Savior, faithful and true each day. Heed what he saith, do what he willeth, he is a living way. So glad and free, Jesus, greatest, highest, I will come to thee. Amen.
Amen. As we continue on here, sing of our commitment to Christ. Join me in singing, I'll live for Jesus day after day. Song number 400, I'll live for Jesus. I'll live for Jesus day after day. I'll live for Jesus, let come what may. The Holy Spirit I will obey and live for Jesus day after day. Through every day, new joy I find. He gives to me real peace of mind until the day when Christ I see. I'll live for Jesus who died for Man, I hope that's your aim this evening. Uh, Brother Dan, if you'd come with scripture reading. <laughs> Good evening. Our scripture reading is found in 2 Samuel chapter 23. And we'll be reading verses 8 through 17. 2 Samuel 23, verse 8. All right, as you're able, please stand for the reading of God's word. 2 Samuel 23, verse 8. These be the names of the mighty men whom David had. The Tachmonite that sat in the seat, chief among the captains, the same was Adino, the ends knight. He lifted up his spear against 800 whom he slew at one time. And after him was Eleazar, the son of Dodo, the Ammonite, <clears throat> one of three mighty men with David when they defiled the Philistines that were gathered together <clears throat> to battle and the men of Israel were gone away. He arose and smote the Philistines until his hand was weary and his hand clave unto the sword. And the Lord wrought a great victory that day, and the people returned after him only to spoil. And after him was Shammah, the son of Agi, the Hararite, and the Philistines were gathered together into a troop, where was a piece of ground full of lentils, and the people fled from the Philistines. And he stood in the midst of the ground and defended it, and slew the Philistines, and the Lord wrought a great victory. And three of the thirty chief went down and came to David in harvest time unto the cave of Adullam, and the troop of the Philistines pitched in the valley of Rephaim. And David was then in a hold, and the garrison of the Philistines was then in Bethlehem. And David longed and said, O oh, that, that one would give me drink of the water of the well of Bethlehem, which is by the gate. And the three mighty men break through the host of the Philistines and drew water out of the well of Bethlehem that was by the gate and took it and brought it to David. Nevertheless, he would not drink thereof, but poured it out unto the Lord. And he said, Be it far from me, O Lord, that I should do this. Is not this the blood of the men that went in jeopardy of their lives? Therefore, he would not drink it. These things did these three mighty men. May God be praised for his precious word. You may be seated. Well, we'll move on to our prayer corner. Just to linger with the one who set me free. As I lift my eyes and see his awesome glory, I remember who he is and bow the knee. Bow the knee.
away this evening. Uh, Brother Rick Jones will be bringing God's word here in just a moment. Uh, before he comes, though, please join me in one more song this evening. Servant's Heart, song number 431, or again on the wall behind me. Give me, Lord, a servant's heart. Make me a servant like you, dear Lord, living each day, humble and meek, helping the weak, loving in all that I say. Give me, Lord, a servant's heart, here's my life, take every part. Give me, Lord, a servant's heart, help me draw so close to you. Let your love come shining through. Give me, Lord, a servant's heart. Give me, Lord, a servant's heart. Make me a witness like you, dear Lord, showing the love of thy cross. Sharing servant's heart. Use my life, take every part. Give me, Lord, a servant's heart. Help me draw so close to you that your love come shining through. Give me, Lord, a servant's heart. Give me, Lord, a servant's heart. Thank you for the great singing this evening. Brother Rick. Well, as I indicated on Wednesday night, I wasn't sure if I would be here, but I am. And uh, the Lord has, at times in my life, when uh, as I study His Word, or and, and this happens sometimes also when I'll hear uh, somebody speaking or preaching, um, and it's happened a few times when pastor's been speaking, and I don't know if he's watching this, or um, he probably maybe see recording, if not watching it, um, that uh, sometimes when he's speaking, 
I get an idea for a sermon, and it, not because I think I can do it better than he can, just to get the Lord brings to mind some other things or aspects that I never really thought of until I heard it uh, spoken. And I'm sure that uh, the, and this is not one of them, by the way, but uh, just that at times that's happened, and I'll have things written down, and I'll, as I'm uh, uh, listening or reading my Bible and devotions, whatever it might be, whether it's during that time or not, uh, sometimes the Lord will bring something to mind. And, and so this is sort of a compilation of that, in a sense, because there's been, there have been some things that I have listened to or read, and the Lord speaks to my heart, and I want to uh, then put it together. And, and of course, when I put these little thoughts together, I never know what's going to come out in the end. And I ask the Lord for help because I definitely need it. And in fact, um, right now, let's go ahead and pray because I know I need the Lord's guidance as um, I go through this uh, small sermon that we have here. Father, we are thankful for your goodness to us. Father, you are in charge of our lives. You're in charge of this world. And Lord, you are concerned about every little thing. And we thank you for that. We thank you that you care about us, that Father, uh, you still desire to use us, whether it's uh, in consideration of uh, our small church whether it's in consideration of our area, our world. Lord, no matter what it is, whether it's us individually or us as a church family, as uh, Lord, we have opportunity to serve, to minister for you, that, Father, you would help us to do those things, that, Father, as I speak, that your Holy Spirit would lead me, that your Holy Spirit would use me, and, Father, that you would help all of us to understand you a little bit better, that we can understand our relationship with you we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, when I was young, and I'm not anymore, I'm starting to realize that now, um, you know, when you're at a certain age and nobody knows how old you are, and uh, in my case, no, I don't color my hair what's left, um, but I do uh, just, I'm blessed that I really don't have a lot of gray. And Lurdine, the same thing. And often we are mistaken for much younger couple than uh, others might think. And I'm not going to tell you my age. I think most of you probably know anyway already. But I've had sometimes students who uh, will guess, and they'll guess the ripe old age of 30 or something like that, you know, because their, from their perspective, that is old to them. And my wife found out one time when she was uh, teaching a class one year, I think it was, we were 25, right, sweetheart, at the time? And she had mentioned to them how old she was. Oh, that's not old, Mrs. Jones. The next year, she asked another class. He said, how old are you? And he said, um, 26. Oh, yeah, you're old. Okay, we understand now. So apparently that's the switch off somewhere in that, that time frame, uh, depending on, upon what the students think. But uh, when I was young, I often wondered and was concerned about what people thought of me. Now, maybe as a, a young person, if you remember back that far, um, <clears throat> Excuse me. What people thought of you was um, maybe more important than what it ought to have been. And I think a lot of times we get into that mode. Oh, how is this going to affect me? Or how are people going to look at me? How are they going to think of me? And it's not that we shouldn't care about that. Uh, of course, the priority should be on our Lord. But um, and what he thinks of us and in whatever the situation is. But uh, the priority should be on, on our, our, the right focus. And so I was a good at a lot of things when I was a kid. I was good at sports, pretty much any sport I could excel at. Um, I was very fast for my height, which I was always the shortest in my class. And um, yet I was able to, especially playing football, I could slip right under people because I was that uh, small and I was quick. And um, I was good at ping pong or at pool or basketball. And I would play my younger brothers, who really weren't too far from me as far as age, especially the next youngest. He was only a year younger. But he wasn't as uh, blessed in ability, I guess you could say. And um, he was good at certain things like fighting that I was not. And so if I ever got mad at him, I would hit him and run because I could run faster. And so that worked out better for me. But um, I was also, unfortunately, because of this, I was very competitive. I loved competing and I loved winning. And um, that also made me very annoying. And as you can imagine, that did not make me to have many friends amongst my uh, closely known people in that sense. Whenever I would compete, I would win, and many times. In fact, I remember one time, um, well, I, I think that 
many times we're not competent in certain areas, and those areas we are competent in, then we have a tendency to focus on those things, and those things that mean nothing uh, many times to us. Um, I remember one time my wife's family was visiting, her sister and friend and her son, and we were playing a game which I was very good at. It was called Boggle. And how many of you have played Boggle before? Okay, if you've played Boggle, you know it's a word game, basically. Now, I can't say that my vocabulary was any <clears throat> better. In fact, I know it's not better than uh, at least my wife's and um, my family. I have no idea. Her, her sister, oldest sister, is a teacher, and I'm sure her vocabulary, although she was an elementary teacher, so maybe that limits your vocabulary when you're uh, teaching younger kids. Uh, that's a possibility, I suppose. But I played against them by myself, against the, those three, and still destroyed them every time. And I'm not saying this uh, as far as boastful, but I asked my wife. It was, it was one of those things. I just happened to be able to see the words. I could see them there. And I would, do, I would remember to add an S to a word, so I'd have two different words, you know, those type of things. And so um, I look at those past successes, put it in quotes there, successes, and realize the same thing that Paul realized, and that is that it is all a waste. All those successes mean absolutely nothing to me. Uh, and, and really, they aren't that important. They're fun to think about at times or fun stories to tell. Uh, sometimes they're good illustrations for uh, students when we have chapel or if I have devotions with them, and I'm able to use an example of, of something that is helpful for them to understand themselves. Because when I was that age, I really didn't understand myself. I didn't understand who I was, what I was, what I was doing, what my purpose was in life. Um, and so I know that it was all a waste. Uh, one time my wife and I were driving, and I think we were driving all the way down to Florida, but taking a long trip down there uh, through Louisiana and visiting some, some people that we knew there. And um, she asked me a question because at this point um, I had graduated from school, from Bible college with a pastoral theology degree. I had um, graduated or was teaching at the school and really loved teaching but wasn't quite sure what to do, what I should um, head for or, or try for, or what the next step was. And um, from the time I was in seventh grade, I had always wanted to be a meteorologist. That was just a dream I had. I loved the idea of being a meteorologist and going out to uh, follow tornadoes and chase tornadoes and see hurricanes and stand there on the shore while the waves are beating and the wind's blowing you all over the place. And uh, I just thought that was such a, a great thing to do. And she told me, she says, sweetheart, what, what do you want to do? It, no matter what it is, I'll, I'll be there with you. I'll, I'll follow you. I'll do whatever it is that you want, want to do. But just what do you want to do? And I, I had really not thought about it. I just knew this, though. What I figured out was this. Whatever it is that I do, I, I just know that when I do something for God, it's going to be more worthwhile. And it's going to be, and I'm not tr just shooting for rewards, although Paul said there is nothing wrong with that, to, sh uh, to trying to get rewards from God for the things that we do. But I was just, I just knew that being a meteorologist, as enjoyable as that would be, as fun as that would be, as, as um, sort of a life-fulfilling goal that would be for me, that wasn't something that was as worthwhile as doing whatever it is that the Lord would want me to do. And so here in 2 Samuel then, um, where uh, Dan had read earlier, he talks about some men who were ready to uh, do anything, no matter what it was that uh, his, their king wanted them to do. But I'm going to focus a little bit on, on them. And they're in 2 Samuel chapter 23 again. And it says there, of course, starting in verse 8, but I'm going to focus on three verses here. Um, and these three verses are in verses uh, 13. I'm looking through here. Uh, it was uh, 15 through 17. And I'm in, the wrong I'm in the wrong book. No wonder I couldn't find it. Uh, 2 Samuel 23. I was in 1 Samuel. And it, it says here in verses... Um, where I was? So, okay, verse 15, it says... And David longed and said, Oh, that one would give me a drink of the water of the well of Bethlehem, which is by the gate. And the three mighty men break through the host of Philistines and drew water out of the well of Bethlehem that was by the gate and took it and brought it to David. 
Nevertheless, he would not drink thereof, but poured it out unto the Lord. And he said, Be it far from me, O Lord, that I should, not, uh, that I should do this. Is not this the blood of the men that went in jeopardy of their lives? Therefore, he would not drink it. These things did these three mighty men. And so in the subheading of my, um, on my phone, where I have my Bible, it has, a, for that section, it has David's mighty men. But, you know, in thinking through it, 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 it's always amazed me, first of all, that the stories, especially of the, the one man who had his sword in his hand for so long that they, he, he couldn't even let go of it. It basically cramped into that position, holding his sword as he fought off all the Philistines. And yeah, I was just amazed at that. What would cause somebody to do that? First of all, I would imagine the training and the uh, preparation, physical preparation, to do something like that would be a tremendous amount of, of preparation for that. It would have to take a good while to do that. But the truth is that he loved his king. He loved his nation. But I think the most important thing to realize that in all of these men, their love, the primary love that they had was the same love that David had. Uh, do you remember when David was uh, there visiting his brothers at the battle when Saul was king? And out comes Goliath. And Goliath comes out and challenges the Israelites, and all the Israelites flee. They're hiding, and they, they just don't know what to do. And they said, what are we going to do about this guy? He's an, it, it's incredible. He's challenging us, and we can't do a thing. And David started asking the men, well, what, what would happen to the man who, who defeated him or fought him? And they told him what it was, and he, he went and asked somebody else, and his brother heard him. His brothers heard him, and he says... Who are you? you what are you going to do? You know, you, who'd you leave those, little, those few sheep with? Um, you're a nobody, David, is what they're trying to say. And David answered him with the answer that we should have for any time that we're challenged to do something, and that is this. Does anybody know what the words were that he said? Is there not a cause? Isn't there a purpose? Isn't there a plan? Isn't there a God that we have who can do more than we can ever think of on our own? Now, I don't know if his brothers knew about what David had done to the bear and to the lion, but he knew what God had done with him to that bear and the lion. And so we think about ourselves and we ask ourselves then in our lives, what am I doing? Why am I doing the things that I do? Why am I here? What does God want me to do? And um, how can I be then like David? How can I be like David's mighty man? How can I be, uh, have that, that might, and, and I, when I wrote my title, I put the might of life is the title of the sermon, but might, I put it in quotes. And the reason I put it in quotes is we can talk about might in two different ways, and might being the strength that we have, the strength that we have to do the things that God wants us to do, or the might, will I do it or won't I? And, and that's kind of the question that we have to answer for ourselves. Am I ready do I have the confidence in God to do the things that he wants me to do? And we're going to look at some verses here um, and just uh, search the Bible. And there are going to be two things that I think that um, God wants us to be confident in, in order to be the type of person that these men were, as an example. And so turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. So 1 Corinthians chapter 4, in this uh, first point, has to do with um, confidence, and I am confident, and I think we can be confident, that God wants us to be faithful. God wants us to be faithful. 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 2 says this. It says, Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. Now, we are stewards of God. He's given us this life. He's given us this body. He's given us the opportunity to be in this church. He's given us a knowledge of him. He's given us his word. He's given us so many things in this life, uh, the, the things that we have that we can use for him, whether it's our money, whether it's our, our homes, whether it's our vehicles, no matter what it is, he's given us the confidence that we can do those things as his stewards or use those things as his stewards. And so we ask ourselves, um, 
are we good stewards of what he's given us? Because it says the one main thing that we have to know is that as stewards, it's required that we be found faithful. And so are we faithful? I think it takes two things to be faithful to God, to, to have faith in him, to have trust in him, to know that he is going to take care of us. I think David had it, his mighty men had it, and that is this, that first of all, we have to know him. And in order to know God, we have to spend time with him. And the focus here, I'm not trying to focus on, uh, on this aspect of it, but the more you spend time with God, the more you get to know him, then the more uh, we know about him and we know who he is. We have confidence that this is the way God is. And we get to know God a couple of ways. Number one is we read his word and we learn about who he is and we talk to him. and We pray for him or pray to him for ourselves, for our needs, for others. We get to know who God is. We know him personally. And that takes time. Now, when I was first saved, when I first made profession of faith, when I first heard about God, I was, I was joyful and I wanted to go to church and I wanted to, to know more about him. But I tell you, through time and through busyness of life, it's easy to put that on a back burner. I remember the times in, in my life where I was so uh, joyful in having a relationship with God that while I was driving in my car, I was by myself, this is a good thing, um, I would just, songs would just come to my, my head and I would just sing in praise to the Lord. And I thought some of the songs were good. It didn't matter whether they were really good or not. I just know that what I was singing was things that I wanted to let God know about what was in my heart and, and what um, I was experiencing at time. Philippians 3.10 says, that I might know, may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings be made conformable unto his death, if that by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. God wants us to know him in a way that we are just bubbling over with confidence that he can do what he wants us to do. Now, I don't know what God wants you to do in your life. I know there are some things that we as Christians know God wants us to do. We know he wants us to tell others about Christ. We know he wants us to live for him, to live uh, a life that is pleasing to him, a life that is, uh, has him as the center of everything that we do, whether it's our decisions or whether it's our choices, uh, which I guess are the same things, but our, our, our life, to where we walk, what we do, where we go, uh, who it is that we, we talk to, who it is that we have relationships with, all of that has to do with knowing who God is and knowing our purpose. I, I've mentioned a, a few times in testimony about the post office, and, and I've just realized this year, I've been there 18 years at the post office, uh, working there full-time at first and then part-time since then. And it, it can wear on you after a while. Uh, you know, I only do it on Saturdays now, and sometimes at Christmas and, and sometimes during the summer. But, and, and I really, I do enjoy the job. I, I really do. It's, it's sort of a challenge to me to get all that mail put up as fast as possible and try to get it out as fast as possible and put away or uh, put in the mailboxes and packages and deliver it as fast as possible. But in the last few years, since COVID has hit, especially when we've gotten more and more parcels, that becomes more of a, of a problem. When I was younger, um, we had football games at the church where I was. We, we had a turkey bowl in particular. That was the one main one. And I would play in the turkey bowl every year. I mean, I would, I would sometimes have a hard time uh, sleeping because I was so excited about playing in this football game. And we played flag football or touch. And, um, but it was, it was a physical game. And we'd play from about 9 o'clock until noon. Uh, three hours of running around for men, young men some, and sometimes a little bit older men, who probably didn't exercise the rest of the year. Now you can imagine, for some of you that have done something like that, uh, the, the, the feelings that you get in your body the next day. I, I got to the point where at one time I would get up the next morning on that Friday morning, and as I would get up I'd be like, Ugh, uh, uh, and Lorraine got tired of it, and she says, you know what, if you keep making those noises, if you're in that much pain, you are not going to play football again the next year. 
So the next day on Saturday, I got up and I was like much quieter than I had been before because I loved football so much. I wanted to play it. And I thought, how could they? They can't play without me. I've got to be there. It's just required that I'm there. And, um, you know, it, 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 uh, it, I realized that it's the same way at the post office. Every Saturday now, it's been so much physical activity that it really, I wake up the next morning, I'm a little bit sore. Not to the point of when I was playing football, but my muscles are not being used during the week anymore. And I need to make sure that, uh, each, I, I think that it's helping me with physical exercise. But the one thing that I've, that I've seen God do is, as I've been asking him more and more often, do you want me here? Do you want me to be here? And do you have a purpose for me here? Um, and I've asked him, and I've been praying that, and a lot within the last uh, year especially, and every single time he, something happens that shows me, yes, he does want me here. And I, I, yesterday it was um, uh, one of the workers that was helping me do the, the last part of packages that were, were leftovers from her out, and I was out delivering them, and he comes up, and I had uh, BBN playing on my, I have a speaker and connected to my phone, and I was playing BBN, and it, BBN is very, very good as far as music and sermons, things like that. And so you can, uh, if you don't listen to it, if you want to know more about it, just let me know. It's, it's a really good radio station, uh, and I would, I would highly recommend it for anybody. Good stuff that's on there. But um, that's really beside the point, because when he came up to me and I asked him, I said, uh, so how are you doing? Because all of those guys have been working basically 16 hours each day, every day of the week. And they all were required to work today. It, could they get me? They would have got, asked me to do it as well. But they knew that I had other responsibilities. And I said, I would, have lo- I would love to help you guys tomorrow. Um, I feel bad for you because uh, you know, some of them were putting in 70-plus hours a week easily. And Now, they're getting a lot of overtime, but physically it just wears on you after a while. And the older you get, the more it wears on you. But I um, asked him, I said, boy, I wish I could, I've told him, I wish I could help you guys. I said, but I can't. I've got a, our, our pastor has uh, COVID, so he won't be able to be there. And he's asked me to preach tomorrow. And so I need to get ready for that. He was like, oh, he says, have you done that before? I was like, well, yeah, I've done it before. And not, not preach for him for that, but I've done it before. I've prepared so many. Oh, he says that. And he, he, he found something out about me and he got interested in the fact that something he didn't realize about me. The Lord allowed me to share a little bit about my life and about some, something that is important to me. And for the first time, I talked to this guy a few times, and I never heard him get that, that sense of interest in his voice before. And yet the Lord did that. And then there have been a few times I've, I've mentioned going into work and praying and when I was getting there, and then uh, the Lord had our supervisor one time ask me right when I get in there, and I had just been praying to the Lord, Lord, do you want me here? Do you want me to, to stay here? And, uh, you know, am I still doing any good? And as soon as I got in, he asked me, he says, hey, hey, Rick, he says, let me ask you a question. And he says, what do you think about infant baptism? Now, I don't know how many times you've gone to a secular workplace, but probably not very often do they come up and ask you a question about infant baptism. And, and I told him what I thought, and I told him about what, the Bible, what I thought the Bible said, and that... And it was just a confirmation that God wants me there. And I guess maybe I'm more like a Gideon, and it's nice to have that confirmation uh, to know what the Lord wants you to do. But I think we need to know God. And God shows himself in many different ways, and I think we need to love him. When you love somebody, when you love somebody like God in such a way that you're willing to do anything for him, no matter what it is, And that's exactly what David's men were like. They loved God so much. They loved their king because he loved God. And you think about his example with Goliath, then you think about them. Oh, I want to be like him because he's following God. He trusted God. God took care of him. And it's obvious that God took care of these men as well. And I think that their love for God was increased because of that. Go to Ezekiel chapter 22. Ezekiel um, is at a time of Israel when they were just not doing all that well. And God saw uh, Ezekiel and asked him, um, or or telling him about the the people there, and the priests and the the people that were the leaders and just the people, the princes of the land. Um, And he comes to one voice, uh, one part, This verse, verse 30, chapter 22, verse 30. 
And it says, And I sought for a man among them. Those people that he had mentioned, the priests, the leaders, the princes. And he said, I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy it, but I found none. You know, God is always looking for people to stand in the gap where there is an opening. The, the way that that word is um, interpreted throughout uh, almost all of Hebrews is a breach. It's an opening where something can get through, where something can cause a problem. Um, if we have a I remember, the, the, is it the Hanover Dam? Is that what the name of it is that comes through, uh, that runs, the river runs through through Kent? Um, I think it's the Hanover Dam. That one had a problem a few years ago, and they had to shore it up and to strengthen it. But if that thing had had, if they had had a lot of rain, which they had expected at one point, and uh, were wondering whether it was going to fail or not, and they had put sandbags all around buildings, I remember down in, in Kent Valley, and they finally got it fixed. But if that had that one breach in that and it just started failing, you can understand how the rest of the valley would have suffered because of that. And that's the same thing for Christianity today. God's always looking for someone to stand in the gap. Someone, um, and he's looking for a faithful. Now, this is a long quote. He's looking for a faithful. I'm going to do this because I want to do the Lord's work and see it flourish kind of people. That's what he's looking for. Whatever it is God wants me to do, I want to do it. And, and I think that we have people like that, and I think that many times they don't get seen, and that's fine, but I think that we need to understand that we need to be that way. You know, God can use you, God can use any of us in a way doesn't have to be um, a very big way. I have had people help in the school, I've had people help in, in other areas, uh, I, have, I have some students right now in my class who love going around and, and wanting to do something in the church building. They love the physical type of things, and they'll come and ask me after they finish their work, Mr. Jones, what can we do? And, and that's what God is looking for. He wants somebody to ask, what can I do? How can I help? How can I get involved? How can I... I, I they, may, they enjoy it, that is true, and we should be able to enjoy God's work as well, but they're willing to do anything. You know, there is a... Um, the faithfulness involves being zealous for, for God, zealous for him. Because that zeal that we need uh, to live for God, that drives us to, to uh, do our best in whatever task that he gives us to do. Um, you know, we have to be zealous in good works. And, and remember Phineas in uh, the book of Exodus, when the Israelites were sinning with the Moabites, and he, because of his zeal, stayed God's hand from destroying the entire nation because he was willing to do what needed to be done. It was a difficult task, um, what he did. And um, Phineas uh, needs, or we need to be like Phineas, where we're willing to do whatever needs to be done to correct ourselves even. In Revelation chapter 3, you don't need to turn over there, but Revelation chapter 3, um, God reveals to us uh, something from the church there at Laodicea. He says in verse 14, for we are made partakers of Christ. We hold, I'm in the wrong one. I'm in Hebrews. That doesn't sound, didn't sound right. Uh, I had the right chapter, but it didn't really work very well as far as what I was trying to uh, talk about. And getting there. My wife's saying, yes, you should have marked them beforehand. All right. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, these things say at the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. And I think sometimes we need to be zealous to the point where we look at our own lives and we can see the correction that needs to happen. Um, you know, often, um, I know that when pastor gives an a invitation toward the end, that He's looking to, 
he's asking so that we can make a commitment to a decision that God is working or the Holy Spirit's working in our hearts for us to make. And sometimes, um, I, I, I guess things have changed. And I remember many times going forward or going to the altar. And I don't think that's a necessity that it has to happen that way. But, you know, sometimes I think that just doing that or, or even uh, bowing down at our, our pew or wherever it is, or just in our hearts making sure that we are, if, we're gonna, if God's working in our hearts, that we are zealous to do what it is that God wants us to do. And that zeal um, really is important. So a second point, not quite as long as the first one, is the con- first one was confident that God wants us to be faithful. And the second one, co- I'm confident that God wants his servants to do right. Go to Micah chapter 6. Micah chapter 6. These verses are the ones that, that came to mind. Uh, as I was thinking through what I wanted to speak on and these things about what God just expects of his, of his servants and how he wants us to live for him. And my, uh, Micah chapter 6 and go to verse, well, let's start in verse 6. It says, Wherewith shall I, become, shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves of a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams or with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has showed thee, O man, what is good, and what doth the Lord require of thee, but to do justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. First, God requires us, um, if we're going to do right, is to do justly. Do the right thing. Thing. Do the fair thing. And, and that comes partly in what we talked about before in looking at our own lives and seeing what we might need to change. Being willing to say, you know what, I'm lacking in this area. I'm weak in this area. Because, you know, God said that when we're weak, he's strong. At least he can be. He's not strong unless we allow him to be strong in our lives. If we're trusting in him, then he can be strong and you can be better than you could ever be on your own. I think that's the whole point of that, is that we are not good on our own in many areas of our lives. In fact, every area of our lives. We may have talents, but still not as good as if God did it through us. And we need to trust that God will do that. We need to do justly. We need to be fair. We need to be honest about who we are and not compare ourselves to others And not say, I am more righteous than this other person, therefore I can teach them how to be better and understand that we are not anywhere near what we think we are. Because if we look at ourselves compared to Christ, then we are certainly lacking. The second one there is that he requires us to be like him. And so if you look at that verse 8 again, uh, to love mercy. I am not um, a naturally merciful person person. Um, I look at what somebody did and, and of course, um, I can look at my own life and say, hmm, it's a good thing that God doesn't act like that. God is a merciful God. I can look at somebody and, and not have natural mercy, but I can say, God, how do you want me to help this person? How do you want me to treat this person? How do you want me? And you know what the biggest thing I found for myself is to not say anything right away. Because many times, if somebody else is there, my wife especially, my wife especially, um, she, she will show me what the best way to answer would be. And immediately the Lord shows me, that's what you need to be like. That's how you need to be. Now, this is not a sermon about praise for my wife and all the things that she does. Uh, she is a wonderful wife. The Lord has blessed um, both of us with uh, life to, our life together. We've, we've done uh, a lot that the Lord's allowed us to do, and, and the Lord has blessed the things that we have done. But I know both of us know that we need, have a long way to go, but we learn from each other. And we can learn from other Christians as well. And I see other Christians and the things they do, and it amazes me, wow, why don't I do that? Well, because I'm not letting the Lord work in my life. Now, we all have different personalities. I'm not talking about that, but I'm talking about um, just the idea of being like God, to be like him. And it says to show mercy. You know, let others... 
how do I put this? Make sure that you don't think so highly of yourself that you have the answers to everything under the, under the sun for the problems that are there. Because we don't. And, and we can't. But we can get the right answer when the need is there if we try to be like God and show mercy to others. I have, um, my wife and I have, uh, know this uh, man, man now, I want to call him a boy because when I last knew him, he was on my bus route back in Virginia. And this boy, uh, and Lurdine reminded me of this, I remember it at the time, but I had forgotten, he ended up in jail. He had been in jail for a short time, uh, I don't remember how long it was, and he was out for three months and then ended up uh, committing an armed robbery and was put back in jail, and I don't remember how many years it was, 20-something years, I think, and he just got out recently. And I was just talking to him on the phone this afternoon. Um, he, he is learning. He says he loves the Lord. His um, language might betray that sometimes. But he gets excited about little things. And I think sometimes we forget about those little things in life. You know, he got excited about, they had this Christmas tree they put up. It's about this tall from here to, to here. The white Christmas tree. I look at it and I thought, man, that looks pathetic. Are you kidding? I, I mean, to me, that's what it looked like. And some of you might think that, yeah, it is pathetic. What are you talking about? But not to him. And I look at it and I start looking at it through his eyes and I start imagining he hasn't had a Christmas tree probably in 20 something years. And the excitement of, of, that he has as a child. And then he started talking about how um, you know, you know, you and, and Lurleen, your family to me because you were there for me. Now, we can tell you for 20 something years, we didn't even know where he was. I didn't even know he was in jail until he had gotten out. But he knew that what we at that time were trying to show him as much love as we could, as we had uh, time for, as we had the ability to do while we were his bus captain and and, uh, and help her here to, to try to do something for him, to try to help him, because his dad had died. His dad was in the military, and he had died when he was probably about 10 years old. And that became a serious problem in his life. He had anger issues, and those anger issues uh, rose up to cause him some problems and ended up in jail because of it. And so to show mercy to him in spite of his language issues or his lack of understanding of who God is, um, the Lord started showing me that I needed to be like that because um, our pastor used to say back in Virginia, but for the grace of God, there go I. Because it can happen to any of us. We are all made of the same stuff. We're all sinful flesh. And if we give in to the flesh, we can be just as bad as anybody else. And so we need to make sure that we are like God. And then the last part there in that verse, it says to love mercy and to walk humbly with him or with thy God. How are we supposed to walk? We're supposed to walk humbly. And so realization that we are not as important as we might think we are or as even others might think we are. To walk humbly and know that we are nothing more than a servant. If we've done the minimum that he requires of us, we are just a servant. We've done what we're supposed to do. We've done our job. That's what he wants us to do. How, does he walk, uh, how do we walk humbly? And I think that that's the other part there, is to know him. Like, it's, like we want to know who he is, what he's like. Learn about him every day. Become more and more like his son, Jesus Christ, like he wants us to do. And so if we know him and we walk humbly, then we can be like David's mighty men. These, the mighty men were brave, but they had seen David's trust in God and they adopted his God and faith in him. And we can do the same thing by trusting our God and have faith in him and live for him and become more like his son each and every day. And so I leave you this question. Are you faithful? Are you faithful? Are you trusting? Are you the person that God wants you to be? And if so, 
um, that's great. You can praise the Lord to thank you, but we all know that there are some areas we can always improve in. But if you are not, if the Lord's brought to mind some things, as um, Pastor often says, he says he preaches the sermon to himself first. And if you study scripture and you're trying to teach others, and especially kids, I, I, I give a simple devotion in my class, and I see the Lord telling me about things in my life as well. That ought to be the way that God's word is for us. And is that what's happened today? If that's what's happened, then when we pray, just take the opportunity to ask God to help you. And we'll go ahead and pray right now. And then we'll ask uh, Timothy, if you wouldn't mind playing the song. And as we um, have our eyes closed and heads bowed, and you just ask God to help you in your need that he may have revealed to you. Father, we are thankful for your love for us. We're so, so grateful, Lord, for your, your kindness, your mercy. Uh, Lord, how you desire to use us, no matter how unworthy we are. Help us, Father, to live for you, to be your children, to serve you with our whole hearts. And Father, we ask as we think, Lord, about what you're teaching us, or we're listening to your Holy Spirit's leading, that, Father, we would be willing to tell you what it is that you want us to do. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Just keep